Hello, hello, and welcome once again to a Beatles talk show podcast that we call Things We Said Today. This happens every two weeks, and we talk about anything and everything that has to do with the Fab Four. Their years together, their years apart, their music, their history, what happened in the past, what's going on today, and sometimes we even tackle the future too. I'm Ken Michaels, and I do hope you're familiar with my Beatles radio program, which is syndicated on around 50 radio stations called Every Little Thing. I also do another Beatles talk show podcast bi-weekly called Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. And I have my own YouTube channel called Ken Michaels Radio, which is loaded with nothing but conversations about the Beatles. And I'm being joined by my two regulars this time out, Darren DeVivo, who has been a legend. Yes, <laughs> I call him a legend in New York radio at New York's WFUV. I love to embarrass him here on the show. He's Keep been for almost 40 <laughs> years. I don't know anyone better on the radio than Darren. Oh, so that's nice. I'm glued Thank to you. my radio in the car. I have to make sure I listen when he's on. And uh, WFPV plays the best in new rock, I would say, and a lot of classic rock, too. And Darren's been manning the fort there, as I said, for the past 40 years and occasionally does specials on the Beatles. Darren, hello. Hello, hello. Hello, and, and very kind of you, Ken. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Happy holidays. And we also have Alan Cozen with us. Alan is the co-author of the much-heralded uh, the McCartney Legacy, Volume 1, along with Adrian Sinclair. And he's also authored Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything, and The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop. Many years working at the New York Times in their classical department and still writes periodically for various publications as a freelance writer. Hello, Alan. Hey, Ken. Hey, Darren. And hello, everyone out there. Hey, Hello. On today's show, we have two very special guests that we're going to welcome in just a few minutes to talk about someone who was a key part of Beatle history, part of their inner circle. And uh, it's a well-known Beatles author and also someone related to that person in Beatles history. And that's coming your way in just a few moments from now. But as usual, we have the latest in Beatle news to get to. And the first news item... I might struggle with because I just found out about it literally yep. a few minutes before we started recording. So yep. I had to scribble notes here in my own, my own handwriting, but it was just announced today that there will be a band on the run 50th anniversary edition. This will be coming out three different ways. One LP half speed mastered vinyl. Now, I should point out that in all three versions here, it's going to include, as it did in the American version, Helen Wheels. There will be a two CD version. Okay. Now, the thing is, the first CD is going to be the album with Helen Wheels. And then it includes um, what they're calling an underdubbed mix of songs. Okay. And that's all the songs except for Helen Wheels. That's a two CD set. It's going to go for 1998. And there will be a two LP version, which is the same thing, the full album with Helen Wheels, the underdub mix of songs, except for Helen Wheels. And that will have, uh, let's see, a, a two Linda Polaroid posters to go along with that. The CD, I should say, also includes uh, a double-sided fold-out Polaroid poster, again, taken by Linda. And it says on Paul's own website, paulmccarty.com, ships February the 2nd. So they are acknowledging the 50th anniversary of Ben on the Run with uh, all these different versions coming out. Okay? We all need to buy our 20th version of Ben on the Run to our collection. <laughs> And still no demos. <laughs> I, that's no, what I. 60. I don't. I, when I saw that, what is it under under dubbing underwear? What is this? sort of under like it's sort of like a, a play on overdubbing, but this is not overdubbed. It's so they're saying underdubbed. See, right. In other okay. words, it's, well, it's, I thought... it's it's um it's tracks it's the tracks of band on the run before 
they were overdubbed. Now there there is a set described that way that has been up for auction that was among Jeff Emmerich's tapes, but these, f- from what I'm hearing, are not those. What these are are mixes made um, shortly before the orchestral overdubbing session for Tony Visconti to listen to while he was doing the arrangements. That's what and I probably horns, I would think. Maybe hearing Jet without the horns or uh, yeah. Bluebird without the saxophone. That's what I'm thinking. It's yeah, just the- all without any of the orchestral overdubs. But there are probably also some missing, you know, guitar lines and things too. You know, just just some last minute overdubs that were made after this set was made. Okay. Uh, so it's interesting, but you know, given a choice for a second disc to go with Band <laughs> on the Run, I would have wanted to hear those four track demos that yeah. were done uh in August 73 with Denny Sywell drumming and Henry McCulloch on lead guitar. Yeah. That's what it I would have been think. interesting since Denny said that Paul kind of copied what Denny was doing. Yeah. If we heard those demos and we could hear how close Paul's drumming was to Denny's. Right. Right. And 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 these were and it was it was copies of these demos that Paul had on cassette when he was mugged in Africa. Yeah. And the tapes were supposedly lost as a result of that. That's not the case. They exist somewhere. Yeah, those are just cassette copies. They're... Not those that's but the there man, are man- track open real masters. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Well, the 55th anniversary will be <laughs> rolling around soon. <laughs> All right. Ringo Starr will be returning to Las Vegas with his current all-star band for six dates starting May 22nd next year. Tickets went on sale November 28th for those with fan access and on November 29th to the general public. Ringo's quoted as saying, I've always said, I'm my happiest when I'm playing with great musicians, and this band is one of the very best. Tickets are available at Ticketmaster, and um, you know what this means. I mean, Ringo has said that normally he does two tours a year, one in the spring and one in the fall. These are the first dates being announced for the spring, so you know that more dates are going to follow, and we'll probably hear something fairly soon about that. This will make Darren very happy, especially, and probably Alan. Ringo gave an interview to AARP in which he addressed the terrible rumors that the Beatles' new song, Now and Then, was made using AI technology to recreate John Lennon's voice. Initially, when announcing the new song, Paul McCartney said it was done through AI and using Peter Jackson's Mal software to achieve that. But he was only referring to separating John's voice on the demo from the piano he was playing, and there was no tampering or altering John's voice. Ringo says there were terrible rumors that it's not John, it's AI, whatever BS people said. (laughs) Paul and I would not have done that. It's a beautiful song and a nice way to finally close that door. End of quote. After our conversation with Peter Jackson, where we're going on and on, how frustrating it is to hear everybody say this was done through AI. It's nice to see Ringo making this comment here. And he mentioned BS, which was another BS is another sort of um, uh, artificial intelligence. Um, that's that's for the next new Beatles song. So you, they'll use BS on it. Speaking of Ringo, he's just released another book through Julian's Auctions called Beats and Threads, described as an illustrated journey through the former Beatles drummer's career, featuring images of everything from his drum kits to his trend-setting wardrobes. This is a 312-page book sold through the publishing division of Julian's Auctions. The publisher announced, featuring nearly 300 shimmering images capturing iconic and many never-before-seen intimate moments of Ringo's illustrious life and career, along with the drum icon's warm memories told in his own words, this immense tribute to the enduring influence and time-transcending impact of the Fab Four member is a ticket to ride through fashion and Beatles history. Beats and Threads has a list price of $80, along with a signed limited edition in a box set for as much as $750, and a signed unboxed one for $500. 
and all the proceeds will be donated to the Lotus Foundation, which is Ringo's charity, which offers support for various charitable projects from substance abuse to homelessness. Another book right there coming from Ringo going to charity. Paul McCartney played a surprise gig. Did you know about this? On November the 28th, to kick off his tour of Brazil when he played a small club in front of just 300 people. The venue club, the De Juro, hosted the event, and it was announced that morning on social media. Tickets went to fans who already had tickets for his Thursday performance at the Mane Garincha Stadium. Paul did a 22-song set with no surprises in the set list. It's just nice to know that occasionally Paul does these things and plays in a small club. Doesn't have to do that. You know, most of the shows he does are stadium shows. Right. And director and actor Rob Reiner is about to make a sequel to his funny and classic mockumentary, This is Spinal Tap. 40 years uh, making after making his directorial debut with the film. And it looks like Paul, Elton John, and Garth Brooks will be making appearances in the film. Reiner revealed this in the podcast RHLSTP with Richard Herring, the sequel is said to mimic the style of The Last Waltz, the legendary concert film that documented the final tour of the Canadian rock band, The Band, and Reiner will be filming for the sequel in February. So probably another cameo, just like Pirates of the Caribbean, I suppose, something like that from Paul, but nice to see he's involved with something like this. If they could find a stage door. Have you seen, you, you know, Spinal Tap and they get lost backstage? Yeah. And they can't find the stage door? Okay. I have to remember that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, classic film and just glad to see that Paul's involved with it. And Guitar World is reporting some big auction news. Gotta have rock and roll, who yeah. is hosting the auction, will have up for bids Paul McCartney's Paul McCartney Was Here, 1960 Hopner Violin Bass, which they say will fetch over $300,000. This was played by Paul, who gave it as a gift to a music executive. And Paul signed the top. Paul McCartney was here. There's also a 1962 Fender Stratocaster that was a backstage favorite for the Beatles, once owned by Chris Montez, who toured with the Beatles, along with Tommy Rowe in March 1963. And the guitar was played by John and George, possibly Paul, who would have had to have played it upside down. The Strat could go anywhere from 500000 to a $1 million. The current auctions run December 15th and the 16th. And for more information, visit gottahaverockandroll.com. G-O-T-T-A for gotta, spell rock, the word and, A-N-D, roll.com. Also, Paul McCartney is releasing an album featuring two unreleased songs, but you can only hear it on a children's audio player. The album is called Say Hello to Paul McCartney, and it will feature songs from Paul's solo career, including We All Stand Together and Mullah Kintyre. The unreleased songs are called Hey Grand Dude and Hey Nan Dude, two instrumental themes that accompany audio readings from uh, his children's book series, Hey Grand Dude. They will be released on Yodo, a portable audio device aimed at children aged 3 to 12 that play audio cards that slot into its top. Sir Paul was an early investor in this product, which is seen by parents as a more wholesome alternative to screens. The company is now moving into adult music for children, which introduces young listeners to classic pop and rock. Two Beatle cards are already available, each described as though they are the selections in the Red and the Blue albums. Paul is said to be such a fan of the band that he bought Yodos for colleagues with children. If you are curious to find out, I know all 14 songs on this collection, it's really a very interesting list aimed at children. Uh, the songs are Grand Dude Theme, Dance Tonight, Little Willow, Heart of the Country, Mary Had a Little Lamb, We All Stand Together, Great Day, Mama's Little Girl, Calico Skies, Let Em In, Mull of Kintyre, Winter Bird When Winter Comes, Who Cares, and Nan Dude Theme. 
This is all from I, the first. <clears throat> not Pico like an icon? No, and Big Boy's Bickering is not on there either. That's what I meant. Uh, I blew another joke. <laughs> that's what I meant, Big Boy's Bickering. Or for you, that's not going to be on it? Nope. Oh, okay. <clears throat> if Ireland Back to the Irish is not on there either. I don't understand. I got to get a new comedy writer. <laughs> More Paul news in a new interview in Rolling Stone. Getty Lee said that he was introduced to Paul McCartney by Dave Grohl at one of the Taylor Hawkins tributes, and Paul tried to convince him to have Rush get back on the road and tour again. Paul said to Getty, you know what Ringo says, it's what we do. Getty's quoted as saying about Paul, that's the way he looks at life. He's ageless because he really, truly believes he was born to do this. That's what you do. And you just do it. You don't question it. And I think we all sometimes forget that. End of quote. Getty has just released his own memoir called My Effin Life. <laughs> also, I haven't seen it yet. But as you know, there was a big benefit concert for Denny Lane that took place November 27th at the Troubadour. Um, and uh, it is now available to stream online, and I will send Alan the link for this if you folks want to see it. Star studded cast, uh, all paying tribute to Denny Lane for his health issues at the moment. Also, uh, on the Billboard charts in America, the, Be the Beatles single for Now and Then, which debuted at number seven, becoming the group's 35th top 10 single. Dropped all the way down to 76 the next week and is now completely off the charts. A two-week run. On the Billboard album charts, the Blue Album, 1967 to 1970, re-entered the charts at 15, then dropped to 37. The Red Album re-entered the charts at 20 and dropped to number 50. We also note that Dolly Parton's debut on the album charts with uh, her four-album set, two-CD set, Rockstar, which covers her her uh, version of Let It Be with Paul and Ringo playing on it debuts at number three on the album charts. And we should be very proud, Darren, because uh, Now and Then is the number one song in the U.S. on the AAA charts. AAA, yeah. uh, which stands for Adult Alternative Airplay. That's the format that Darren uh, the, works with. Yeah, F FUV, yeah, is sort yeah. of, sort of, sort of is a triple a station yeah we're still playing now and then it's still one of our what are you going to call it hot songs and hits uh-huh you, know, you know so which is cool and support fuv they were playing the song every hour on the hour that day when it was released and uh triple a is is a great format it's one of my great for one of my favorite formats of radio along with a good oldie station but if you want to discover new rock these days, if you're more of a rocker than anything else, you don't want to hear what Top 40 is playing, uh, AAA, to me, is the way to go. Uh, on uh, the UK's official singles charts, Now and Then falls from number 6 to number 11 after spending two weeks at number 1. John and Yoko's Christmas classic, Happy Christmas War is Over, re-enters the charts at 85. On the official physical singles charts, now and then hold steady at number one for three weeks. And Ringo's Rewind Forward is at number 20 after spending six weeks on the charts, peaking at number four. All right, just a few more items here. Uh, last Tuesday, November 28th, at the memorial service for First Lady Rosalind Carter, uh, Trisha Yearwood and Garth Brooks performed John Lennon's Imagine as a tribute to Rosalind. And uh, I, I don't know how you how this can be unnoticed but the Beatles song in my life is being featured in a new tv commercial for amazon featuring three elderly women who go tobogganing it's not the Beatles recording of the song but rather a very pretty instrumental version played on the piano one final item our good friends the weaklings the power pop band that has put out several albums in which they cover well-known and more obscure Beatles songs, mixing them with their originals, will have a new album coming out. Their fourth one, due out January 19th, called Raspberry Park. Their album will include 13 original songs, four uniquely reimagined covers, 
and there will be two covers of Beatles songs, including I've Just Seen a Face, which recently was released as a digital single. The Weaklings are among the many guests appearing at the Fest for Beatles fans in February. Oh, I do want to mention one more thing. Sad news to report on the passing of Les McGuire. Les was the original keyboardist and saxophonist for Jerry and the Pacemakers. As we all know, the band was managed as part of the stable of Brian Epstein's company, NEMS Enterprises. George Martin as well produced the group. Les was the last surviving member of Jerry and the Pacemakers, and he has died at the age of 81. Okay. And that's all the Beatle news we have for you right now. And before we move on to our special interview, we'll hear a couple of words about Paul McCartney's Life and Lyrics podcast. Stay tuned. I'm Paul Muldoon, a poet who, over the past several years, has had the good fortune to record hours of conversations with one of the world's greatest songwriters, Sir Paul McCartney, reflecting on everything from the Beatles to Wings. The result is our new podcast, McCartney, A Life in Lyrics. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. And as promised, we have two very special guests on the show this time. Ken Womack, if you don't know his name by now, well, where have you been living? He's probably written more Beatle books in recent years than just about anyone that I know. He's written such books as uh, Solid State on the Beatles' Abbey Road album and the studio, uh, The Last Days of John Lennon. He wrote uh, this book along with Jason Krupa, Paris and Clapton. And other assorted love songs he's written two books that are biographies on the life of george martin and this is his latest book living the beatles legend the untold story of mal evans and uh he's also a fifth member of the other talk show podcast that i co-host talk more talk and he has his own podcast on the beatles everything fab four a busy guy. He's always got a new book in the works, and we're so grateful that he's joining us this time. Hello, Ken. Hi, Ken. Thanks for having me. I'm sure thrilled to be with you guys. And also we have with us Gary Evans, who happens to be the son of Mal Evans. Mal had a son and a daughter, and Julie is the daughter. And uh, Gary participated a lot in helping Ken out with this book. He's here to share his memories of his father and to talk about his life and history. Welcome, Gary. Thank you very much, Ken. And such a pleasure to be in such esteemed company. <laughs> Thank you. I've got to tell you, um, Ken, you've really outdone yourself with this book. I mean, almost every page I, I learned something that I hadn't heard before. <laughs> there was a ton of research that I'm sure you did. And I know this was a labor of love for you. Um, what I'd like to do is start the conversation. I know this has been brought up in a few interviews with you, but I think it's really important to tell the folks watching this um, the fact that when Mal was working on his memoirs in uh, 75 or so, and unfortunately, we know of his of his death in January of 76. After that, all these papers somehow got lost. And there is a story that you tell in the book of, of how they were retrieved. And Yoko Ono played a very big part in this. If it wasn't for Yoko, we may not even have had all these papers of, uh, you know, his manuscripts and, and memoirs. Can you tell the folks how all that happened? Sure. Um, and I have to tell you, one of my favorite parts of this project was tracing this material, which I followed around the world. I, I can now account for everyone who had it in their custody. Um, it uh, when, when Mal died on January 4th, 1976, it created this kind of, I guess, a vacuum situation. Um, Grosset and Dunlip were trying to figure out how they were going to still publish the book. They had paid a pretty sizable advance, although some of that was covered by insurance. They were still eager to engage their investment. 
um, for a brief moment, the materials were actually lost when a couple of Mal's cohorts uh, absconded with them. They they had to be reminded that they didn't belong to them and returned under threat of uh, some kind of litigation. Um, but really, the, the the bottom line about these materials is that it was really kind of cruel. Uh, I don't know a better word for this, that the materials were not returned to the family forthwith. Um, they, uh, I understand Grosset's fiduciary interest, but you know, they, they really, no one, no one came to the point where they thought this belongs to somebody else. Anyway, for several years, they attempted to publish the material, sometimes consulting uh, Gary's mother, Lily, sometimes not. Um, eventually, uh, and, and perhaps for much, if not all of this period of 12 years, they were in the basement of the New York Life building. And uh, sat there until a temporary worker named Lena Cootie found them in uh, 1988. She had been hired uh, along with a, a tonnage of other temp workers because uh, Putnam's had purchased Grosset a few years earlier. And it was time to get out of that lease and move uptown to where Putnam's had their offices. Um, in any event, uh, Lena was there for one week. Um, so her time was quite short in the storage room, as they called the basement. And uh, she was working for other temps. The supervisor was a temp, and that's when she discovered all of this material. And her first thought was Beatles stuff. Um, she was a big fan. She recognized it to, to be of some import. She didn't know who Mal was, but she went to the New York Public Library branch near her and learned about him. Um, and uh, discovered, you know, that he had a family, et cetera, and um, began to push pretty hard at Grosset for them, or the now Putnams, to do something about this. Uh, and they they weren't interested. And when they finally started to think about it with any depth, it looked like a legal problem to them. And so they really didn't want to deal with it. And knowing that her time was very short there, uh, Lena did two things. One, she made an inventory, which she mailed to Lily Evans uh, later that year. And she also penned a note uh, for Yoko, walked uptown to the Dakota and handed it to the doorman uh, and said, you need to give this to Yoko. Uh, he did. Uh, and it essentially said, you know, this is your employee. Uh, these materials need to be returned to his family. You know, do something about it. And it was really quite wonderful. And, and she's a, a really terrific person, still with us, thankfully, uh, an Estonian immigrant. It reminds me every time I, I talk to her, which I did just this week, believe it or not, um, She, I, I think of that Hamilton line, immigrants, they get the job done. Yeah. And, uh, and she really did. You know, she's just magnificent. And uh, she works on a horse farm up north of the city. Uh, doesn't uh, She only gets the New York Post, doesn't use the Internet. Um, et cetera, et cetera. It's, uh, she's just a fascinating person, also an artist. In fact, in volume two, we plan to include her self-portrait when we get to her section uh, and we open up the the story of Mal. But it really is quite a remarkable tale. And um, yeah. following this material around has been just inter very interesting. Everybody I've called who had it in their custody at one point was damn surprised to hear from somebody about it. Now, after Mal died, did the Evans family in any way, were they aware that Mal was working on this book? Oh, yeah. He had. Uh, he was very clear in both his correspondence and in telephone calls with Lily and, and Gary and, and Julie as well that this project was underway. He had met with a, uh, a lecture, some folks with a lecture tour. Uh, they were setting up a kind of, you know, lecture mm -hmm. schedule for him. Um, he was imagining earning thousands of dollars a night. That may have been a pipe dream uh, back in 1976. But in any event, Mal was gearing up for the book's release. It was completed sometime probably in November of 1975. He finished uh, the one editorial uh, suggestion that he received from from the head of uh, of that unit. So he was good to go. Why did they publish it? <laughs> well, um, they realized they had a legal problem with Mal being dead. And uh, they began to contact, or I don't know, Gary might say Badger, his mother, 
into trying to put it out. And um, they just realized that they had a, a legal issue in terms of the contract, which I have. And I can see when you when you study the documents how um, they weren't on on a firm footing necessarily. Um, but they really felt for their for whatever reason, like they had to have her permission. And so they tried several tactics over the years. They'd send emissaries uh, over to meet with Gary and Lily. Um, they uh, tried to work with, um, you know, ghost writers thinking, well, maybe we could uh, put it out in, in other sorts of, of formats. But, you know, it for whatever reason, they felt like they needed to have that OK. And of course, Lily would write back and we have all the correspondence and say, just give us our stuff. Hmm. You know, and the kids need to see their father's materials. Um, there, there's no reason for us, you know, to continue this this conversation. If we want to publish it later, we will. Uh, can I just jump in, Ken? I want to ask Ken and Gary. It fascinated me that, I mean, I'm trying to envision what it was, what these archives were. Was it a box or was it boxes? Was it manuscripts in many different boxes? And how did it just get taken out of the Evans home and 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 almost held hostage? It seems Mal like. had a little alcove in his bedroom uh, in Los Angeles where he kept the boxes. They were in several bankers' boxes. Okay, um, there were several, but not all of the diaries. In fact, Gary. When he got the diaries, he was like, where's 1967? And he looked up, right, Gary? And it was on a shelf at their home. Indeed, yes. And it had been there all along. Um, there were 3,500 photographs, manuscripts, um, stored pretty haphazardly. Mal was a pack rat, or you could say he was the first Beatles historian. Um, thankfully, uh, Lena did such a great service when she... Um, kept that inventory because it allows us to understand what was in there uh, when she made this discovery and then work with other data we have about what was in there, you know, approximately 75, 1976. Um, but it, yeah, not only was Yoko uh, just absolutely heroic in pushing all the right buttons, it, it, Neil scrambled into action uh, in the UK, in fact, had the joy of, of putting together some of the, the transmittal for the book. Um, but not only did those things occur, but the Apple lawyers were just amazing. They uh, This is why good lawyering is so important. This is a just a master class in it. It was like Star Wars, as I like to say. I mean, it was these are not the droids you're looking for. They went over Obi Obi Wan Kenobi like, and it was across the street, by the way, from Gold Feral Marks, where where mm. where Rossett had been. And they said, "We're here for our stuff. This guy worked for us. You will give it back. You will, you know, cede all copyright to his family and the Evans estate." You know, they had they just were ready with all the right uh, communications for these guys and just nailed it. This is really a miraculous story when you consider that Lena only worked there for one week. <laughs> yeah, she had a new job at Credit Suisse, and uh, uh, she worked like the Dickens for this. And, uh, you know, she, she's just a marvelous woman. And, um, in fact, we need to go up to that horse farm sometime, Gary, and thank her personally. Uh, up and up. Yeah. <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd love to give you a cousin and say thank you very much. Yeah really cool person i mean we really shouldn't i mean by all the the way that things get lost in our world it is quite amazing that this stuff survived exactly yeah um answer this very simple question here when you read your book it seems apparent to me that of all the beatles mal felt closest to paul do you know why that was did he have a different relationship with each of the Beatles? That's Gary? A tough one. Yeah, yeah, Gary might have some insight into that. I yeah, would... I'd... <laughs> well, he bonded with George first. And as time progressed, there was more synergy, more common ground with Paul, I think. And especially when Dad lived with the best part of the year, from 66 going into 67. Um, but, yeah, they just seemed... Well, with the three other guys, but mid 60s, Paul, 
Yeah. I'm, I'm losing you. Yeah. Uh, you uh, yep. Gary, but I'm losing his, his audio. Okay. In mid 60s. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my dad and Paul had a really good fit. They seem to have more time for each other than any of the other guys. Uh, with, whether that was by design, I don't know. But definitely Paul and my dad were, were, was the number one relationship going forward. And, um, and just, my dad lived with the guy for six months. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When he first saw the Beatles at the Cavern, what was it that, that drew the Beatles to him? I mean, we all know how great the Beatles were, but was there something specific? I know in the book, yeah, it's mentioned about the high harmonies of the Beatles. I think, yeah, I, I'm a, my dad was a big guy, you know this, uh, and he had time for everybody, and he immediately would have struck up a rapport with the guys. He would have been at the front chatting to them between songs. Yeah, I, I just think it was... It was a real a meeting of minds, if you like. He was the right fit for them. Uh, he loved them. They loved him. And he it loved them. I and mean, when he heard them, they sounded like, you know, really, he said, really good rock, like Elvis. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that was irresistible to him. And he was a huge Elvis Presley fan. And he figures in this book, obviously, when the Beatles met Elvis and Elvis phoned mal in 1971 easter time just to wish him a happy easter but uh he was a bigger elvis fan than than a beatles fan that's elvis absolutely... was his god yeah yeah we could forgive him for that <laughs> we could although i i you know he would he would always say elvis was his guy but you know he bled heart and soul for the beatles as we know i mean I I have uh, I think one of the reasons he may have cottoned to Paul so much was just he was in admiration of him. You know, I think we if you see Paul create songs like we did in the Get Back docu series, I mean, how do you not fall in awe of that? Um, as we all did, just seeing it, you know, low these years later. Right. There, there's I some... believe. Yeah, I believe it might not be documented, but I think Elvis offered my band a job to join the, the Mafia. Uh, but I don't think my dad was going to jump ship to join Elvis's crew. Huh. Since, um, we, since we're talking about Elvis, um, the, the book opens up an age-old question that's been debated in a million ways over the years, which is whether the Beatles jammed with Elvis. And in the <laughs> anthology, um, John says he did, and the other three say... I don't know what John was doing, but we didn't jam with Elvis. And now we have Mal not only saying they did jam with Elvis, but going into all the detail about making the the plectrums out of plastic forks because he didn't have his kit with him. Um, <laughs> so, so what do we think now? Did they jam with him or didn't they? Well, uh, you know, I I would, as as you know, Alan, contemporaneous evidence rules the day. Mal wrote up his notes about Elvis almost immediately. Yeah. Uh, and wrote them at great length. I mean, there are dozens and dozens of pages about that meeting. Um, and yeah. he recorded it more than once uh, in different parts of his archive. So is it his uh, diary? It's a uh, it's it's diary it, entry that. No, it's not a diary entry. He writes it up, uh, you know, longhand. He writes it up for posterity. I mean, it was a big deal to him. Mm, yeah. Um, so I would, I would give John and Mal a little more credence. Uh, John, of course, was saying it uh, closer to the event, and Mal was saying it almost right on top of the event uh, right. taking place. Um, so that raises the question of how could the other three have forgotten jamming with Elvis <laughs> you know what I mean it's kind of a big deal you would think if I jam with the Beatles I'd remember it I know it <laughs> <laughs> yeah absolutely I think you I think you would too I I mean obviously these guys were enormously busy it's <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to make of that or many of the other kind of miniature mysteries that we find inside this 
this storyline. Yeah. Gary, do you remember him? Did he ever tell you about the meeting with Elvis, you know, when he on, on some of his trips home? Uh, you were he little, didn't but... tell me about that specific meeting, but he did tell me a lot about how much he loved Elvis and um, how, how it was a thrill to be in Liverpool in the 50s and 60s, uh, early 60s, going to the to the cinema, seeing Elvis on screen, and then to be in his presence. Must have been pretty mind-blowing for the guy. And yeah. for Paul to say, hey, El, hey Elvis, uh, he's your biggest fan, and hand the phone over to, to my dad before they before he actually met the guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he, he, he must have been trembling, you know, as yeah. he talked to the... There he is with the four people around him. You know, that's an everyday thing. Must have blown his mind. Yeah. It says in the book that um, when the Beatles were at the cavern, that Mal would request, um, I forgot to remember to forget, and George would intentionally mess up the lyrics. (laughs) So, yeah. Let's talk just a little bit about before the Beatles. (laughs) Uh, Just to know your father's interests, because I know it says in the book, he loved to swim. He liked bicycling. He loved Western films. And in fact, the reason why you were named Gary is after Gary Cooper. Of course, who died in 1961. There were an awful lot of baby Garys around in uh, late 61, early 62. Uh I I, I went to school with a lot of Garys. (laughs) And also uh, his love for Westerns um, led to his love for guns, too. So... uh, yeah, well, he one day he shot himself in the mirror with. My mum still had the mirror with. I'm I'm losing the audio there. Yeah, uh, one day he shot himself with a. He had a BB gun, and he shot his reflection and broke the mirror, and my mum said, "Well, there's seven years bad luck." Fortunately, he didn't live to to get rid of the seven years bad luck. <laughs> All right. Can you, yeah. Can you hear me, Ken? Yes. Okay. You're much better right now. Thank you. Okay. So we're just going to bounce around to all the different co-hosts who each have questions for you. And uh, Darren, you're next. Uh, I'm 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 uh, fascinated uh, by um, your dad's relationship with what were then known as the Ivies, one of the uh, one of the Apple bands. Um, and one of the early signings to Apple, can 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 you either either can or Gary elaborate on Apple's been created? I'm sure Mal has sees Apple as an opportunity for him to kind of get his own fingerprints on an act, and then along comes the Ivies. Talk about the beginnings of the Ivies coming into Apple and how Mal. Uh, was part of all of that and and how their relationship developed and uh, from there. Well, yeah, Gary can speak to the relationship, but, you know, whatever the Beatles had in front of them and felt was important was important to Mal. So, you know, he would, sure, he would see his own benefit, but he considered whatever they told him to be his marching orders. And obviously Apple was important to the boys, right? So that was good enough for Mal. Um, He would do whatever they required, just like he did with everything else uh, in the Beatles universe. You know, there was no job too big or too small. And uh, when, when it was clear that the one thing they really wanted was kind of an A and R effort to find new talent, you know, all of the other subterfuge about whether he was going to be managing director or this role or that role aside, Mal flung himself into that job, you know, and um, as, as just about as much as anybody else, really, um, and just was had dogged belief in how great the Ivies were uh, and what their potential was. And of course, history has shown he was damn right. Yep. Uh, in terms of songwriting, especially twin, uh, you know, uh, leads and, and lead vocalists, et cetera. You know, they, he was on to something and he was dead set on championing them. Uh, Peter Asher was kind of interesting in, in my conversations with him. 
He said he was never in the way about Badfinger. He didn't think that Badfinger was as good as James Taylor, but that's a minor point, right? Um, he said Mal had the clout. If Mal wanted them, Mal was going to get them. Um, it probably took more time than Mal liked to uh, to land that deal, but um, he just threw himself headfirst into it. And, and of course, going, I, I hate to use the word cruelty twice in one interview, but what Alan Klein does to Mal uh, over Badfinger probably is payback for not being able to fire him is just terrible. You know, um, what he does to Mal and Neil, I mean, he really just does everything he can to make them feel unwelcome. And uh, Mal being a vulnerable, sensitive sort, uh, intentionally let Alan know how much he wanted to work with Badfinger. And you can almost see Alan's mind turning, right? And saying, well, then you won't be working with Badfinger. Um, but, you know, Gary, uh, not only did Badfinger perf perform a, an important part of Mal's professional life, um, he worked like dogs, like a dog for them. They were also key aspects of the family life, too. I mean, Gary knew all these guys as a youngster. Yeah, they come round several times, at least for a Sunday roast, uh, including Bill, their manager whose son famously almost became a beast. We lost you there. Yeah. It was that Bill Collins' son almost became a beetle. Did you know that story? Yeah. Yeah, that's another rabbit hole we need to look into at some point. Uh, yeah, so they come around quite a lot during the summer, um, to hang around individually and as a group. They were really good friends of my dad's and their families would come around and have a great time. And do you have, um, Gary, do you have uh, some personal uh, memories of, of maybe um, having conversations with the guys from Badfinger during that time? Uh, not necessarily at that nascent time where they're just kicking off. At one point, my dad said, but when they were the, the Ivies, he asked me, can you think of a, a new name for them? Of course, Neil Aspinall came up with bad things. But for about a week, I was going through my mind, what would these guys be called? I can't recall what I thought at the time, but they must probably be very childish names. <laughs> uh, yeah, but uh, as an adult, I spent a lot of time with Tom Evans, and uh, he was such a lovely soul. Took we their own lives. We lost your audio. Oh, you've lost my audio. It's no, right here. Just no, like the last phrase or, or so. Okay. Yeah. So uh, Tom Evans, really good friend. I I was in my early twenties when he took his own life. So I spent a lot of time with Tom, uh, especially um, after my father died. Uh, he was there for me. Uh, and it really cut him up, losing Pete and then my dad. It, it, he was never the same again, especially, you know, with Pete gone, he was 27, and then my dad passing. It, it, it really did destroy the guy. Uh, and, and at one point, Tom Evans, the co-writer of Without You, is working in a DIY store. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's so tragic. Really, really sad. Mm. Mm. Uh, well, I'm sorry. I said such a talented band. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Did I say that in my out loud voice? <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, what was your dad uh, dad's relationship with? Can you talk a little bit about Neil Aspinall? I yeah, partners in crime, uh, but they they really thought of each other as best friends. Uh, famously, we went to Portugal in 69 on a big family holiday, including the road best. Um, uh, I sent Ken some Super 8 film where I'm goofing around with Rogue and my dad. Yeah, so, yeah, happy times. Neil, Neil was a really nice guy. Used to go around his house a lot. Um, he seemed to be looked after better by the Beatles than my dad. Seemed to yeah, be more of a favourite if there was such a thing. 
Uh, yeah, but I've got good memories of Neil Aspen and Susie. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and I don't mean to be jumping around here, but I have like like random notes of different things. We talked about this, um, I guess it was two years ago when Peter Jackson was on the show for the first time, uh, right before the Get Back documentary debuted. And um, uh, your dad was, Gary, was known as being a very big, strong guy. Uh, I've seen six foot three. I've also seen six foot six, which yeah, six which, foot three, six mm -hmm. three. Yeah. And when the performance on the roof uh, was going to happen, it wasn't going to happen. And it was going to happen. But the bottom line was, if it was going to happen, even if there was a gray area, they had to be ready. And I always wondered to myself, who was the lucky guy that had to schlep all that equipment up to the roof? And at all, when looking at all the individuals and learning through the years of the story and then Peter's documentary was like, that had to be Mal and maybe one or two other assistants. Um, did your dad ever talk about the physical part of the job of working with the Beatles specifically? First of all, being in charge of, I guess, overseeing the roof being fortified, uh, strengthened with wood plank with the wood, the wood planks and then getting guitars and amps and uh, more guitars and, and keyboards up, up on the roof with no guarantee that the performance was going to happen because it could have, they could have pulled the plug on it at the last second. Is there any, any light you could shed or stories about that? Uh, he did. He didn't talk to me about the process, but um, of course the redhead on the roof, Kevin Harrington is his OD in waiting. Yeah, I think now and Kevin did the heavy lift. Uh, no health and safety, of course. I don't know how you would get away with doing th that now. It was yeah. so um, shackled. It's very, very precarious. Yeah, they had to take, uh, take a the skylight apart to get a keyboard up. Or something yes, like that. Ken knows the real details of how they managed to pull it off. Wow. Yeah, Kevin. Kevin spoke to me well many many times actually, uh, but uh, but about this subject, uh, in at great length because I had lots of questions. Um, he knew a little bit about something going on with the engineering. I had to go dig that up myself about Mal uh, bringing in a consultant because the the roof just felt so unstable to him when they made that earlier visit, which is in the docu-series. You see them go up there mm -hmm. um, <laughs> with Michael Lindsay Hogg with his stogie. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, but Mal, uh, Mal recognized that the, that it, the roof was not supportive. And so th that may have actually been the reason for the one day delay from 29th to 30th, because they had to get all that planking up there and, uh, and of course, you hear Ringo point out that his, he's been nailed down at the wrong spot. Well, that's part yeah. of the reason because they had to accommodate the roof um, and uh, probably some very important work. But it just goes to show you the kind of behind the scenes thinking Mal would do right. uh, about mm -hmm. a moment like that. And, yeah, they had to take the skylights off. Kevin said it was uh, it was quite difficult. Uh, both he and, and Michael Lindsay Hogg gave really clear descriptions of just how tight it is up there being able to go from that upper floor and to make the turn where there is no elevator up onto the roof itself. It was quite a, quite a challenge, but of course, Mallet had nothing but challenges over the years, mm -hmm. as you know, including, uh, you know, <laughs> venues where they thought the Beatles would only play with acoustic guitars and wouldn't need electricity. <laughs> yeah. I just, uh, you know, and then the thought that they were still having questions, the four Beatles, on whether or not they wanted to do this, that if I did what your dad did, Gary, and set all that up up there, and I heard <laughs> they're not going to play, I would have went down there going, no, you're getting up there, and you're playing, because yeah. I didn't do all that work, just to now have to break it up and bring it to back inside. Um, and, and not only that, but what you see in that documentary about the role your dad played, uh, yeah. from rounding up food to getting... Uh, to playing uh, to playing the um, on Maxwell Silver Hammer. What's wrong with me here? The and, and, yep, there you go. Oh, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's that's just <laughs> priceless. Uh, and and really the timing, Ken, of your book, uh, 
coming after Peter's documentary. It's made Mal a, the star that he should have been back in the day. You know, the you know, both both doc, both documents, the movie and your book. Um so let's uh Alan, um let's hear from you. Okay. Um fascinating book. Um and part of me, you know, also wanted to read Mao's manuscript as it was. Um, and I'm always curious as I read, you know, it's, it's quoted so plentifully, you know, that it, obviously we're getting a lot of Mal, Mal's manuscript in the book. But, I, you know, I always sort of wonder, you know, what will so what was the manuscript like unmediated in a way? You know what I mean? No, no. Uh, book two of this will uh, which comes out later next year um, will include the unexpurgated manuscript oh, really? uh, completely as Mal prepared it. Very cool. um, Gross had, had gone so far as to create a typescript mm -hmm. uh, based upon, and and frankly, we we have all of the all or most of the apparatus used to compose it. The way Mal composed his memoirs um, was uh, he had hired uh, a woman to be his stenographer, right. who was an employee or a former employee of Capital, and uh, so we have all of her steno books. Uh, that she kept from, they had 20 sessions or so, uh, where Mal would essentially, and he spent a lot of time before working with her by putting together this voluminous notebook of just notes, uh, just to jog his memory about every phase of his time with the Beatles. Wow. And so he would sit and dictate to her out loud, very slowly, his his ideas and his sentences. And uh, Gary discovered some cassette tapes. We have... Uh, Oh, a good hour or so of those sessions where he is reading, um, where he's dictating to the stenographer. Yeah. Um, he had one other person on his team, and that was a, a fellow named John Hornley, who was the ex-art uh, director for Capitol. And uh, Hornley, uh, his job uh, was was a lot easier than than the stenographer, who was his wife or his girlfriend, Joanne Lennard. Uh, John's job was to take the 40 or so photos that Mal had selected to be in the book and uh, work to uh, have them turned into negatives and transparencies, which we have. Mm -hmm. uh, so John did that. He may have also helped out with some cover ideas. There were two covers submitted. Um, and there was one uh, editorial suggestion, which was for Mal to go back and talk about his childhood which he did in, in great detail. Uh, and fortunately we have, we have that chapter two, which was going to be inserted at the beginning. And all of this was part of what disappeared after Mal died. That's Along right. Personal. Okay. And it'll all be in part two. What I, I see, I had, I had thought of part two as just as from what I'd read about it is more like a, um, a collection of Mal's memorabilia, uh, in print. Oh, it will be, uh, it'll include all of his diaries. Uh, so 1963 to 1974. Um, the part of what's interesting, I think about studying anybody's archival history, but in this case, what, what is interesting to me at least is that Mal moved to different kinds of, of resources at different times. You know, sometimes the diaries were King, but then there would be other times when he would, uh, Gary has a blue notebook, for example, which is essentially 1966. And Mal starts working in the blue notebook, you know, for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. um, then he gets a really big diary in 67. And so suddenly we have, uh, you know, we have, uh, we have a lot more detail uh, coming our way. Um, you know, so he moves between different kinds of uh, texts, if, if you will. That was a nice uh, visual you had there, Ken. When there was fireworks right around. Yeah, that's, that's the kind of uh, when I when I emphasize Ken Michaels. That's what happened. <laughs> Sixty-seven was a really special time. It for was, and, and this was highlighted. You know, so um, he moved away from the diary quite obviously in seventy-four because he was working on the book, and he moved to this, like I said, this voluminous um, notebook, which I call the nineteen seventy-five mm -hmm. notebook. Okay. Um, it's interesting on, you know, on one hand, there's a whole new level of knowable trivia, for instance, <laughs> 
August 29th, 1963, the day Mal gets his first ticket for speeding on the Beatles' behalf. You know, I mean, that's that I don't think would have been in any trivia tests until now. Um, and now it can be noted down, Ken. Um, uh, <laughs> and you know, and then you know, the Elvis stuff. And uh, well, uh, one question I had, uh, not terribly important, but when I was reading about the Sullivan show and uh, Mal realizes that he forgot to pack the drum head with the Beatles logo on it. And then it says, uh, you know, he, and he managed to restore it right before the show, but it doesn't say how he managed to restore it. What did he do? Do you know? Did we absolutely do not know. Um, that's uh, that mystery may be lost to time. Um, okay. But uh, uh, he was certainly quaking in his boots. There's in terms of quaking in his boots. I mean, there's this there's this whole sort of other sub layer in the book about what it was like to work for the Beatles and for NEMS that, you know, we don't think about as fans or even historians or, you know, people looking into this. But that's, you know, for instance, everyone being terrified of tr triggering Brian's anger. Um, and then. uh John admitting that the Beatles themselves, because of the pressure cooker that they were in, would take it out on Mal and Neil and Derek and everyone around them. And that must have been, you know, on one hand, you think of the job of working for the Beatles as the most incredible thing. But that was like the other side of it that we don't ever hear about and must have been really difficult, you know. A good analog to that. Uh, Alan is, and I know you've done some of this too, when you talk to the folks who worked at Abbey Road over the years, and they would have a similar kind of response. You know, you'd say, well, it must have been great to be at all those sessions. No, it wasn't at all. They would go on for 10, 12 hours, you know, and you didn't want to catch a Beatles session. <laughs> you know, it, uh, they were painstaking. Um, they had uh, clearly... And this is one of the reasons that I think we can all be just so grateful to be alive and to enjoy this music. They had a sense that they were great artists, yeah. you know, and they had the ambitions to match. Um, but you know, the great thing about Mal and Neil is they learned how to work it. They were good cop, bad cop. They would, uh, if they needed, they would turn the Beatles ire on themselves so that they could get back to working well with each other. Yeah. It's difficult uh, to 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 imagine being in that situation with these guys, especially if you admire them as much as Mal did. You know, um, having them having them sort of explode at you would be, uh, you know, not the ideal thing. But um, you know, I, I once um, interviewed John Curlander, who was uh, a, an engineer at, at Abbey Road during their the the later part of their time, um, and he said, you know, the thing about the Beatles is that individually they were all just great you know you'd have a great time with them they were funny they were friendly they were you know two of them together it was still pretty good three of them together it got a little bit of dicey and if all four of them were together for anybody who wasn't them they would be the most horrible people on the planet <laughs> I don't know, uh, you know, a little bit of that is, it comes through the text here, too, in a way, although it doesn't, you know, not so much in terms of one, two, three and four of them together. But but you can see uh, also, you know, Mal's sister, June, um, talking about how Mal sort of was living in this compartmentalized world of, you know, Beatles world and then his own life and and he was able to sort of make separations between them but she also thought it was sort of damaging him and reading you know through the book all through it it's it's on one hand you think you feel really excited for Mal being there and doing all this stuff and you know helping Paul come up with a line for here, there and everywhere and, you know, pepper and, uh, and fit not to mention fixing a hole and, uh, and all these experiences he has is, but you also sort of can't help feeling bad for Lily and Gary and Julie, you know, because he's, 
oh, he's away, you know? So was was that difficult growing up, Gary? I mean, you, you must have talked to him on the phone and stuff, but but the idea that getting to see him was so infrequent, was, was that hard? The priorities that he had was the four Beatles, and we became a very poor last fifth Beatle in his world. Um, of course, he loved us, and to his dying moments, he still loved us, but primarily he was on board with those four guys for 13 years, you know, uh, up, to, up to 70 when they broke up and post that point. Uh, I coined the phrase, um, it's not alchemy, it's malchemy. Yeah. And you were saying about the four guys together, that's pure malchemy. Uh, and like you're saying, I think uh, four of them in the studio, it was a, it was like herding cats for my dad, but I think he herded them pretty well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and also then um, the talk in the, in the book, uh, there's this uh, scene where George Martin early on takes Mal aside and says that he was sort of jealous of the relationship that Mal was having with him because George had a relationship with him. And, and you also begin, you begin to realize that there are these concentric circles around the Beatles of everybody having their particular relationship and not wanting other relationships to impinge on that relationship. But you also have to realize at some point that those other relationships have a place in it and, and have to be able to, to sort of breathe and, and function. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I guess what I'm saying is, you know, just uh, you know, on one hand, the book is a, a fascinating story, but there's also this sort of psychological underlay all through it because of the 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 kind of life and the kind of pressure cooker that they were in, and you're just sort of seeing how everybody reacts to it differently, and it it, it must have been uh must have been very challenging, but also very exciting. You're right. There was very much as you alluded to, a subtext going on and the, fact, and the fact that they all had jealousies of each other on the time that they were spending with my dad. I think mm. he was the go-to guy of their entourage that they liked spending time with. And, of course, he spent more time with them than anybody else in, in the, the entourage. Uh, and that was uh, plain to see and get back. Uh, Neil was away doing Neil stuff. Dad was just there for the whole seven years of uh, people them. Yeah, what a ride though <laughs> yeah and it did Next lead time to him. 40. yeah and it, it did lead to him in a lot of ways being typecast right as as the as the roadie supreme because he was just so damn good at it you know he was there if the, there was no like i said no job too big no job too small if they needed something he knew where to get it he had the rolodex that he'd built up to to find an anvil to find guitar strings in the middle of the night you know from an instrument vendor he just he had mastered that job and they loved it and and that did hinder his ability to maybe be a managing director or to have other kinds of roles because they just loved having him and i think we're all the better for it frankly you know, they they were able to stay up later and longer and work longer hours and fashion all of those great songs, whereas most of us might have said, you know what, it's 1 a.m., I'm done. Um, Mal, uh, in the words of, of Mal's sister, um, Barbara, mothered them, you know, in a lot of ways at a time when they probably needed it pretty badly, you know, providing meals, comfort, probably just general goodwill telling them they're doing a great job. You know, uh, artists have big egos, and I'm sure Mal uh, supported that too in his in his time with them. There's, and there's... I love the fact. So I love the fact that Peter Jackson even counts on Mal as being the, the like the Beatles counted on Mal. I love watching Peter talk about my dad and saying, "Hey, we what, what would Mal think? You know, with the Mal software, my dad would be so chuffed." That the the mail software was in honor of him. I think of all the th things that have happened, it, that would be uber cool for my dad. Yeah. Uh, Peter Jackson is exactly twenty days younger than me, so 
we're almost like a brother going on there. I'd love to meet Peter Jackson one day because he said so many lovely things about my dad. Mm. Me? Um, there was one other thing in there that that seemed sort of perfectly Mal from the way we, you know, have perceived Mal over the years and now, you know, see more of him in the book is that he wanted to form sort of an association of other roadies, kind of like a union, except that his interest wasn't in negotiating higher wages or lesser hours. His whole interest in it was to get all the roadies together so that they could all together make sure that they were serving their groups the best possible way and that it wasn't about, you know, the normal union thing. So it's kind of interesting that he wants to form a union, but not to get a raise, <laughs> you know, but to just to do the, to do the job most efficiently. And that, yeah, that seems sort of so strike. typical of Mal, you know, <laughs> a union that would never strike. <laughs> yeah, right. Can you imagine? <laughs> So um, I don't know if we have a time for another round, but back to Ken, if we do. Um... We have a few minutes. We can continue a little longer if you'd like. Okay. Well, along the lines of what you were just saying, Ken, um, there is a paragraph here in this book that I felt really summed up the problems that, that Mal had in working with the Beatles. He said, I had been their road manager for too long, and there's no way that the Beatles could see me in any other capacity. From here on to the end of my career as their road manager, I had to fight every step of the way. What would have happened if Ringo had listened to critics saying, you're not an actor, Ringo, you're a drummer, or had told George or John, you're not guitarists, you're electricians or whatever. And then you're right, Mel also recognized that in many ways, he had, he had only himself to blame for his status in the Beatles organization. And Mal said, in my relationship with the Beatles, I was not interested in credit. I put a lot of ideas and thoughts into the projects the Beatles got involved in, but I was so in love with the group. And he added that as far as he was concerned, receiving explicit credit hadn't been necessary. Hmm. It says so much right there in that paragraph. And we all know that Mal, it's really brought up so well in the book, um, had ambitions of songwriting and production um wanting to be in the entertainment world and he only got so far you know it's kind of interesting because you think about how perceptive he was in recognizing the talent of the ivies and he produced no matter what which was a top 10 hit bonafide yeah. hit you would think that that would lead to other work as a producer just having a hit record in the top 10 and you know i i wonder and i know i asked you this before ken how did the Beatles look at at Mal beyond being the roadie and the jack of all trades from an artistic point of view? I know that when um, George got to hear Lonely Man, the song from Splinter, he said to Mal, that's great. Who wrote that? And Mal had to tell him that he co-wrote the song and he was really impressed with with uh, Mal's songwriting there. But is there any indication from the other Beatles of what they thought of him artistically as a talent? You know, I. I don't necessarily, I know I don't have any kind of evidence of that. It wasn't for lack of trying. Um, you know, I mean, he had built, as you just described, he had built a world, he had serviced a world where they were, you know, their needs and interests were the primary needs and interests, and he sublimated his own uh, in their favor. So I don't think we can look away from that. I mean, part of the problem with perhaps not getting a lot of work after no matter what becomes a hit mm. is he had been expressly forbidden from working with bad finger at that point, which sent Mal into a mini depression. You know, mm. I mean, he was very depressed about that. And of course what happens not too long after that, he has to go to a session where George is producing day after day, um, you know, and Mal has to just sit there and take it. Um, and, uh, <laughs> I, 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 it's a shame that, it, it, well, life is timing, right? And timing seemed to always work against Mal, you know, um, uh, you mentioned, uh, Gary mentioned how chuffed his dad would be about the Mal software. Imagine Mal getting to enjoy 
uh, all of the wonderful things we've experienced, you know, the CDs coming out in 87, the anthology, Beatles 1, the remasters, Love, Beatles Love. I mean, uh, all of these, you know, right now the Beatles being number one again, right, in the UK. I mean, that all of this would have been, uh, he would have enjoyed and felt gratified, you know, because he had a part in 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 that success at, at several levels. It just yeah. breaks your heart. I just wonder why, and I know that after the Beatles broke up, he was constantly doing work for them. He helped out with the Live Peace in Toronto show and the UNICEF concert at the Lyceum and uh, the Delaney and Bonnie tour and even the concert for Bangladesh. And Paul asked him to help out with the 73 Wings tour. And before he died, Paul contacted him to ask if he might want to help with the Wings well, what became Wings Over the World tour. So they all still thought highly of him, and they he was still working for them after the breakup in various capacities. I just wonder why. I mean, you've got George starting a record label with Dark Horse, and you've got Ringo starting a record label with Ringo. They could have easily have hired Mal for, in some kind of capacity as a producer or A&R person as he was with, with Apple. And uh, so many opportunities that I wish had happened. And I know you've said, Ken, to me and, and just now that, uh, you know, if he had hung on, he would have been working at Apple alongside Neil. <laughs> so, uh, you know, any thoughts on this? I, I mean, I they probably felt like they were working with Mal. He was an employee. He was yeah. being paid. You know, I, I don't know that that they necessarily felt like there was any lack there. I give George Harrison so much credit. And if you like George Harrison already, which I, I hope most people do, you love him after this book because he was so supportive when Mal needed it. You know, you want to be a producer? Let's get you some lessons. You know, you want to be a songwriter? He champions Mal's song for the Ringo album, right? I mean, and you mentioned Lonely Man. I mean, those are just fabulous moments. I think they probably felt like they were doing those things. You know, obviously they had their own post Beatles challenges pretty mm -hmm. severe at times, uh, without a doubt. Um, but uh, they probably felt like they they were helping him, and that it, part of it is Mal, right? Uh, not to not to blame him, and and I think it's it's always important to point out Mal doesn't engineer his demise over the Beatles. Mal doesn't engineer his demise because they broke up, because he's unsatisfied with his working life. None of that has anything to do with why Mal can't see another day after January 4th, 1976. That is the collision of, you know, private life and and his professional life, something he probably always knew was coming. And he just couldn't bear the fact that Lily, the one person who had believed in him, is now essentially giving up on him hmm. and uh just the idea of that uh sent mal into that final tailspin um you know so uh but but anyway mal may have comported himself in, in such a way that he didn't express that he needed help you know i mean he loved as george harrison said more than once he loved being supportive and working in that capacity and helping other people achieve what they wanted to achieve Right. That may have gotten the best of him when it came to blowing his own horn, right, at key moments. Mm -hmm. He did say to George that he was broke. He did. Hmm. It's just really sad that when you think about all that he had going for him right before he died, the memoirs coming out, it's interesting that you point out that um, he was working on a film called Rody. And this had been gone on for a couple of years. He'd been working on it. Um, and like you said, You and Me, Babe, was on the Ringo album. You know, did he make good money, do you know, from that it song? quite well on the mechanicals from those royalties. Yeah, no, he saw good money. Um, there, You know, he probably did not feel necessarily nonplussed about his professional life. But when Lily, you know, said, I'm going to see a solicitor, an appointment she never kept, by the way, because by then Mal was dead. Mm. Um, he couldn't bear it. I mean, it, we have the great testimony from, uh, I, I think you've all spoken to Ken Mansfield before, 
you know, Ken uh, remembers that call so vividly because it was their last one. And all of Mal's, just Mal talking about all of these great things that were happening, clearly objectively great things, and yet his voice betrayed something else that Ken couldn't help but hear, which was a person in distress. Hmm. Interesting. Very interesting. By the way, one thing I wanted to ask you, Ken, I know you mentioned at the Fest for Beatle fans that there was another song that Mal wrote with George. And I didn't find it in the book. It's it's uh, no, I, I I don't I think maybe you misheard me. He wrote another song that was being considered for the Ringo album called Thinking of You or Thinking of Me. Uh -huh. or Yeah, that I mentioned multiple times. And uh, Ringo did record at least one take of it for the Ringo album. OK, that may have been what I meant. Uh and it's just a wonderful song. We I've never heard the the Ringo version of it, but um, uh, Derek Van Eaton, sorry, Lon Van Eaton, uh, had heard them working on it and remembered it, and asked Klaus Vorman about the piano part that Mal had sort of concocted, and he was able to recreate it for us. Okay. And it's just it's lovely. In fact, I like it a lot better than you and me, babe. So Ringo, if you're you're watching, please release it. It's uh, it's a beautiful little tune. Actually, uh, with you and me, babe, I had no idea. You mentioned that uh, Mal had started writing it in 1968 in India. Oh, it goes way back, yeah. Wow. <laughs> we never knew this until now. But uh, that song that you just mentioned, the, the other song um, for the Ringo album, did he write the entire song, Mal? Oh, yeah. Okay. It's and it's just a lovely little ditty. And uh um Klaus remembers it too. Mm. Uh even at this late date. Just a beautiful little song, kind of Randy Newman-esque, uh, in a way, you know, uh, but just a lovely little love song. Okay. Um, one more thing I want to ask you, Ken. I know because of Mal's diaries, we were able to find out all the musicians that were on All Things Must Pass track by track enough so that we have a, a new reissue of the book all things must pass away um, gary that that was made available oh thank you gary <laughs> um did mal thank do you. the same thing for living in the material world because we don't know song by song yeah he does have several pages on it um i don't know what chapter and verse but i believe we have most of those too Okay. Because remember, part of Mal's new job post Apple, well, or Apple during its disintegration, was to pay the studio musicians. So he would keep track of hours and time and okay. et cetera. Hmm. Okay. Darren, you have any final questions? Yeah, it was just one to piggyback off sort of what you were talking about just now, Ken. Um, the similarities between Badfinger and Mal in that they were in these situations that people would probably kill to be in, uh, to be able to, in Badfinger's case, record for the Beatles label. Wow. You've reached the pinnacle of the top of most of the pop of most. Mm -hmm. And for Mal to be essentially the Fab Four's right-hand man, can't do any better than that yet. Those two positions that both Badfinger and Mal were in had a lot of baggage uh, that ultimately played a role in, uh, it's just too strong word, but demise. Uh, Mal had to deal with a lot of, as we were just talking about, disappointment in those um, post-breakup years in the 70s. And I saw or read, I don't recall which one, an interview where... Um, either you, Gary, or, or Ken, you discussed the state of um, our mental mental health systems then, 70s, as opposed to now, that if we knew what we knew, know now, things might have turned out differently for Mal. He would have been able to find better ways of coping with, you know, the two lives that he led. Um, did you, was any research done towards you know maybe with a medical professional about how maybe pl 
things that Mal could have done um, if you know if we if if they knew what we know now. You know, you know Mal. Saying? We we gotta just take the words right out of Mal's mouth. So he told Laura Gross, you know, he, he knew his predicament, and um, and I think he knew, and I think he voiced this that he needed to get back to his family, that this was not good for him. Um, and this Fran came to understand this too, his LA girlfriend, um, that that was probably the best move for him. He but Mal said to Fran, you know, I, I'm sorry, said to Laura Gross, I just need to clear my head for a couple of weeks, i.e., lose the cocaine and the alcohol, etc., right? Uh, and clear my head and make a good decision. So Mal, I think Mal understood a good bit of his predicament. Um, but he clearly never got to that point where he could clear his head. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, want to talk about another way things could have been different if if Brian lives, right? I mean, Brian may yeah. not have improved Mal's lives life in some way, but Matt, Brian had a, a, a good enough business sense to understand how you take care of employees, right? And that they probably needed to start thinking about Mal and Neil in terms of NDAs or, um, you know, making sure that, that they had plans for them should they decide to pursue another career, et cetera, et cetera. And losing Brian, even though they, they were at loggerhead sometimes, was probably a very, a big loss for Mal and Neil because mm. it put the only two employees of Beatles and company, you know, in, in real peril for a while. For a good long while, you know, they, they didn't get raises in the 70s while Apple was in receivership. You know, they were they were really lost at sea. And, and Neil, of course, developed severe substance abuse issues. Uh, we know what Mal was going through. I mean, it was um, I, I, I maybe I'm overstating Brian's gifts as uh, as a businessman. But I, I do feel like that gulf was very harmful to them, too. Hmm. And did Mal, how clued in was Mal with what Badfinger was going through with their management and with the lawsuits and with Warner Brothers after Apple, um, after Apple's demise? I mean, was 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 Mal aware of what was happening there? Um, with uh, absolutely, he was. I mean, as Gary said, they you know they socialized. Mal knew that the sky was falling as far as Badfinger uh, went. He knew that, you know, it started with Billy Collins' paranoia about Mal, uh, that Alan Klein was able to, you know, shoehorn his way in there and and pull Mal away from them. I mean, they had a good thing going. And, and by Badfinger's memories and by Mal's, certainly, uh, they had found the right chemistry. It's just they kept getting harmed in their attempt to make uh to make good on it you, you probably noticed in the book there were there there came to be certain truisms you know if you if you weren't a beetle it was hard to get your material released uh, after a certain point because alan just didn't care yeah. um, it was alan steckler <laughs> uh who salvaged um no matter what alan klein would never have lifted a finger alan steckler said you know damn it this is a good song why are you sitting on an investment that should pay off for you. And, you know, yeah. lo and behold, it does, yeah. um, you know, Alan, Alan did not have goodwill, uh, not unlike Alan Cozen, who is all goodwill, <laughs> um, but no, he did not. And uh, that he did a lot of damage to a lot of folks. And of course, frying Mal out of that situation opened the door wide for Stan Polly, who was actually named in at least one suicide note. Right. Um, you know, it just uh, it made a god awful situation uh, quite possible. So Mal had to watch and uh, just uh, broken hearted while all of this happened. Hmm. Actually, George Harrison didn't think no matter what was a hit. Which I find hard to believe. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, these are artists, right? I mean, yeah. with complicated egos and. Uh, trying to get their attention and get them to focus on anything, particularly after the divorce conversation in September, 1969, 
was a tough road to hoe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Alan, any last questions? Yeah. So you know, since we're pretty much through the hour, um, I'll just ask one more, which is when volume two is coming. When is that scheduled for? We hope to have it done and, and in, in folks' hands by this fall. Um, it is uh, it's an exciting project because it means people can then go go down their own rabbit holes, as Gary and I like to say, and and find their own way and their own stories in in the Beatles universe and Mao's universe. You know, there'll be plenty of names. They'll be fully annotated. Uh, you know, pictures. We have many, many more unseen photographs for Volume Two. The allowance is four times the amount of photographs. Great. There'll be color. Um, and again, folks will have the diaries. They'll have Mal's manuscripts as he had written them. Um, you know, it's uh, we're excited. It, people will have the the own the, the work all right there in front of them uh, to get lost in their own rabbit holes. Good luck. <laughs> yeah. yeah, can't wait. So I want both. I want to. Uh, can I, uh, I'm sorry, Alan. Didn't mean to cut you off. Another, but feeding off what you just said, movie. Is that a possibility? We uh, there is a documentarian uh, who has the rights, and in fact, Gary and I and Julie met with him uh, while we were out in California. We all met him for the first time, um, and he's been working on it for some time. So hopefully, we'll see some results in the new year. Okay, it's a story that needs to be told even more. Could I just ask Gary one one last question here? That'll be it. <laughs> Okay. I'm just wondering, ever since your father died, did you ever try to contact any of the Beatles yourself? Or did you try to have any ongoing relationship with any of the Beatles kids? Uh, the kids, no. Um, George famously came around early 80s and apologized to my mum. Uh, we also contact, went round to um, Chittenhurst Park where Ringo was living with Barbara mm-hmm. and uh, tried to uh, get some help on selling some Beatle memorabilia. Uh, it, it came to nothing, but it was worth going to kiss Barbara back under the mistletoe, I tell you. Um, <laughs> and then, Paul, we've had some altercations with over selling memorabilia over the years. Um, Famously spent the whole day with him in February 97 with my mum. He he was very gracious. There's always a flip side to Paul's graciousness. I'm not going into any of that. Yeah, but no contact with the kids. Um, Paul's son James famously, a couple of years ago, went up to Richard Porter. You must know Richard Porter. And said, "Um, are you Gary Evans? And Richard said no, and it seemed like he wanted to contact me, but he never did. Mm. Yeah, but, yeah mm. so uh, hardly any contact with them. But George coming round was really lovely. Um, although that's burned into my memory, especially the way you know, to the kitchen with my mum. And uh, he, he, my mum always said, George had a crush on her from the early cabin days. I, I, I'm losing the audio again. Wait, just repeat yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my mum always said that George had a crush on her uh, early cabin days, and he'd come round any excuse for a cup of tea or some egg and chips while she was ironing. Uh, so, and then famously, at one point, she moved his hair and said, Oh, that would look nice. He said, Oh, don't touch the hair. That's our great mark. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That's great. All right. Well, this has been wonderful, guys. Thank you so much, Ken and Gary, for sharing time with us. Again, the book is called Living the Beatles Legend. Holding it up right here. The Untold Story of Mal Evans. And Ken is going to be at the Fest for Beatles fans. We'll be talking a lot about Mal. And uh, your sister Julie will be there. Gary? Yes, you will. Yeah. Okay. Will okay. you be there, Gary? Uh, no, unfortunately, um, my eyesight is failing really badly and I need cataract operations and cornea transplants. So oh. I'm waiting 
for the call at any moment, hopefully, to get some of that done. Hmm. Oh, best of luck with that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Be thinking of you with that, and we'll miss you in February. And yeah, I would have loved to have been there, but I can't swerve the fact that I I might have this done. Hmm. All right, so we'll just have to get to meet you in person in 2025. Yeah, <laughs> after the next volume down, or maybe the the film is being done. Yes, here yeah. you go. Right. Yeah. There's several fests there in the waiting for you. <laughs> right. Yeah, uh, I am a, I am a fest virgin. I must, must do one one day. <laughs> okay. Mal was the first like like guest that the fest had where you really had somebody who was one of the inner sanctum uh, there with the fans. Am I not? Am I right? In the mid seventies, Mal was a guest, right? Oh yeah, nineteen seventy five. Okay. Wow. Okay. Yeah, it even says in the book that he wants to come back every year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I sure wish he had. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you guys so much for spending time with us. Yes. And best of luck. Continued luck with the book. It's getting rave reviews. And uh, I highly recommend it. We all do. Yeah. Living the Beatles legend. <laughs> Well, that was tremendous. What great guests to have here on our show. Thank you so much, Ken and Gary. And like I said, by all means, pick up that book. You're going to learn so much about Mel Evans' life and his relationship with the Beatles and how it all worked out and after the Beatle breakup. It's just, it's absolutely wonderful. Do make sure you pick up that book. Yeah. All right, let's go around the corner here and uh, tell the folks what we're doing and how they could get in contact with us. First with Darren. All right. Catch me on WFUV, 10 p.m. to 2 a.m., Monday through Thursday nights, and Saturday afternoons from 1 to 4. Probably won't be around on the air all that much over the holidays. Not sure what the schedule is going to be like. WFUV also has a year-end fundraiser that's going to be starting, I think, I believe, Saturday. I think it's the 9th we're going to start. So that's a chance for you if you want to contribute, become a member, renew your membership, WFUV.org, the website. And um, also we have an app, but you could use the website and can contribute there. We're non-commercial public radio. And you heard my hours when I'm on the air. I have two Facebook pages. Please contact me there. Uh, and that's, that's I guess, that's it. That's basically it. Okay. Alan? Okay. Um, first of all, all of our information, contact information, show times, you name it, is all in the information um, in the comments under uh, under the shows in uh, on YouTube and in Podbean. So you can get all that information there. But otherwise, you can contact me uh, most easily through Facebook, either at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. And you can write to all of us at things we said today radio show at gmail.com that's a group email address and uh feel free to send ideas um comments whatever you want and uh we'll get back to you if a response is required or if we just feel like it um anyway uh you can also follow us on twitter at, at things we said fab and we have two facebook pages as a group as well one is as you might guess things we said today and the other is things we said today beatles radio fans and all the show information's posted there too so there you go all right thank you alan and by all means since alan has now grown a beard or is trying to grow a beard Get, just have a vote. Whose beard do you like the most? You got three men here, all with various styles of beard, beards, I think. Um, <laughs> we'd like to know. Hmm. Is it Darren, Alan, or me? Very important. I know I we ask very probing questions here on, on this <laughs> on this podcast, but uh, we'd love to the know email thoughts. address for us. <laughs> <laughs> As for me, my email address is everylittlething at att.net. You can also friend me on my Facebook page at Ken Michaels. Um, if you'd like to hear my radio show called Every Little Thing, 
Um, the easiest way to do this, I haven't said this for a while, but um, one of the stations that carries my show is WFDU, mm-hmm. Fairly Dickinson University Station in New Jersey. And um, they uh, have their website, WFDU.FM, and they actually archive the last two shows that aired on the station. So you can hear two shows at any given time. If you go to their website and go into uh, where they have their archive shows, type in every little thing, and my shows are right there. You can listen anytime during the day, or you can go to my website, kenmichaelsradio.com, look up the page for every little thing. It has all the radio stations that airs the shows and when they air it with links to their website so you can stream them. Also, there's my other talk show podcast, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast, which I do with Kid O'Toole, Tom Hunyadi, and Joe Mayo. We just did a show just like this one with Ken Womack and Gary Evans with lots of other different questions that we posed to them about Mel Evans. And that was a lot of fun. Uh, so great to have those two on the show. It is just priceless to get this information because Mel is someone that, you know, we've heard so much about, but actually knew very little other than the fact that he was the Beatles roadie and their loyal friend. And now we know so much more because of this new book, but talk more talk, a solo Beatles video cache you can find on our YouTube channel. And that show uh, normally is a live broadcast every other Monday night at 9 PM Eastern. This was a show that was recorded with Ken and Gary, and it's going to air at 8 PM Eastern. And that is actually well, it's going to be tonight, <laughs> December 4th, but you can play it back anytime right after that. Um, yeah, so there's that. And then there's my own YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio, where I have almost 140 interviews on there. All conversations about the Beatles with everyone from musicians to friends to authors to fellow podcasters like Darren and Alan who have been guests on the channel. So if you can, please subscribe to that one, as well as Talk More Talk. And if you haven't done so already, for things we said today, all on YouTube now. That'll wrap things up for us. We'll be back in just a couple of weeks. Thanks so much to all of you for watching. Again, thanks to Ken Womack and Gary Evans. And for Dallin and Alan, I'm Ken Michael saying thanks so much for tuning in. And we'll see you next time. (laughs) 